I'm so grateful that you keep coming back. God is good. <laughs> oh, I'll try. I hope the Lord comes before then, though. This is also quite a long lecture. I don't know whether we're going to finish it in one night or whether we're going to skip a few slides or go quickly through them, whatever. We'll see how we go. You must have noticed that I'm very fond of my church. Have you noticed that? Yes. But I also have some very hard things to say about my church. Not because I want to knock my church. There are enough people who do that. That's not the point. I have a serious problem. And that is that I do evangelism. And today when you do evangelism, you come across more and more and more people who say, you're talking about Babylon and you're saying, come out of Babylon? And where must I go to? The very things that you are telling me to leave behind, I see in your church as well. Why should I come into your church when those things are also there? Now, in the past, you might have gotten away with it, but not anymore. Let's face it, they're there. They're there. Hmm. And then there's another problem. There are more and more people who want to leave because the things are in the church. So rather than being an ostrich and sticking your head into the sand, face the facts. But of course, if you understand the typological picture, then the whole paradigm shifts. So when I reveal things and talk about things, this is not, please don't misunderstand me, to expose and criticize my church. It is to show that there is a typological framework wherein we must see it, and if you grasp the typology, you embrace the church. So this is not negative, this is positive. And we need a transformation. We need a renewing of the mind so that we can discern truth and error. These are the Persian ruins where the story of Esther and Mordecai unfolds. As you saw, the lecture is titled Mordecai in the Gate. Now it came to pass in the days of... I battle with these names. How do you say it in America? Because every country says... You say Adjuerus? Adjuerus? Wow, I would never have said it like that here. But anyway, Adjuerus. <laughs> which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. So this is a mega kingdom. That in those days when the king... Ajazerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. And these are ruins of Shushan, where many exiled Jews settled. I've never been here. I have this picture compliments of a little friend of mine. But this king was also known as Xerxes. One and the same king. And he's the one who fulfilled the Bible prophecy regarding the destruction of Babylon. Ooh, this is fascinating because here is a little parallel, a typological parallel. We must look at the Bible with new eyes, typologically. Now Cyrus, of course, Cyrus the Great, had conquered Babylon in 539, but he never destroyed it. This was however prophesied by Isaiah that it would happen. And it was left to Xerxes to destroy the city in 59 years later in 480 B.C. So he destroyed 
Babylon. There's another king coming. And he will destroy Babylon. Is it right? Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellence shall be as when God threw, overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. As when God overthrew it. And God is over, going to overthrow Babylon. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. And neither shall the Arabian pitch their tent there, neither shall the shepherd make their fold there. The king gave a great feast and then wanted to show off his queen, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment. Typology. We have a king who represents now a greater king. He has a queen who doesn't want to obey him. Do we have something like that in the world? Yes. So another one will become queen. At the king's commandment by his chamberlains, therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. So now enter beautiful Esther. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away when, you know, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So here was this close relationship. Now it's fascinating that we can read in uh, the commentary that a cuneiform tablet now in the Berlin Museum mentions a high estate official with the name Marduku, which is the Babylonian transliteration of Mordecai, and it doesn't occur anywhere else. It's not a common name to that area. So archaeology confirms the Bible. And the, the Bible says in Esther 2.17 that the king loved Esther above all the women and she obtained, oh, there's that nice word again. Are you beginning to see some links? It's amazing how an archaeologist with his nose in the archaeology and an eschatologist can be so closely associated with each other. She obtained grace and favor in, the si in his sight. Can you hear typological sounds here? So this bride of Christ, will she find favor with the king when his other queen rejects him? In his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Yes, there will be lots of virgins, but there's one that's queen. Don't forget it. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Now the king's gate, of course, was a place of judgment. So here we have a judgment message. Two of the king's chamberlains, Bigtan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king. Now you know that story. It became known to Mordecai. He told it to Esther. She told it to the king. It was recorded, and then they forgot about it. In fact, Mordecai saved the king's life. And in those days, the king promoted Haman. And the Haman became the enemy of God's people. Here is a typology. Here is a typology. All the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage, because there was a higher law than the king's law. 
Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Will there be another king at some stage? In a typology, a king can play two roles, because it's a human king. Will there be another king who will make a command which is contrary to God's law? Yes. And if you don't obey that law, could you be subject to a death decree? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For it told them that he was a Jew. And Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage. Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for he had told him of the people of Mordecai, instead of Haman, sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of... Thank you. The people of Mordecai. And then it gives the exact year, and they cast lots, and the lot fell on the twelfth month, and they decided that all the Jews would die. Then Haman said to the king, There's a certain people scattered and dispersed amongst the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. At the end of time, in the antitype, will there be a certain people scattered throughout the whole world of the final kingdom on the planet? Yes. Their laws are different from all other people, and they do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. Type is going to meet anti-type. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay a certain amount of money. So the king took his signet ring, and he gave it to Haman, who was the enemy of the Jews. This is the ruin of the royal palace where it actually happened. And when this decree went out, Mordecai challenged Esther to discuss the matter with the king, but she was hesitant. Mordecai told them to answer Esther. This is fascinating. Don't think you can hide in the crisis. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. If you think you can befriend the enemy in ecumenical councils or whatever, do not think that you will escape as a consequence. It's not going to happen. You will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And then she said, go and fast. She didn't run. There was no haste. There was time to pray. Never forget that no matter how great the crisis, there's always time to pray. Go and fast, and I will fast, and my maids will fast, and I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I cannot approach God in my sinful nature and live, but if he should extend the hand of grace to me, I can live. Typology of grace. Here's the king and there's the woman. It's fascinating relief. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor, grace, in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Isn't that beautiful? In fact, this king gathered all the virgins in the entire kingdom. But Esther was the queen. After his previous queen decided not to listen to his commandments. So he reverses the decree. 
and the judgment comes on Haman's head, will there be a decree reversal at the end of time by another antitypical king? Will the king of king come and reverse the decree of the king of Babylon at the end of time? Yes. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews. Will there be a mass conversion at the end when these decrees go out, yes or no? Yes. So right at the end, people will stream into the message bearers those whose commandments are different to all the other nations of the world. This church is going to remain full. Many will leave, but many will come in. Now, type will meet anti-type. The mark of the beast. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he caused all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark in, it should say, their right hand or in their foreheads. Nevertheless, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we read in the spirit of prophecy that the decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by, we would say, Ahasuerus, against the Jews in the time of Esther. Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God, but his plots were defeated by a counterpower that reigns amongst the children of men. The Protestant world sees in the little company keeping the Sabbath a what? A Mordecai in the gate. The gate being the place of judgment. And the very name, Laodicea, means nation of judgment. And they see this thorn in their sides because he's saying, you are not keeping the commandments of God, you are keeping the commandments of men. His character and the conduct, his reverence for the law of God are a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord. And the same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages of past will try again to do it at the end of time because there is no, thus says the scripture, regarding the Sabbath issue to defend their theology. So it is better that one group disappear than that the entire group world should suffer as a consequence of one group. There's a parallel there. So these scenes take place in the final scenes of the great controversy between God and Satan. This is where the judgment of the beast power is reversed by God who intercedes on behalf of his people. Here type meets anti-type. Christ, the great anti-type of Aceros, reverses the decree. So we have a decree reversal. It happened then, it will happen there. Is there an archaeological evidence? that such a man, such as Mordecai, existed? Yes. And we read in Revelation twelve seventeen that the dragon was wroth with the woman who kept the commandments and have the testimony. And this fiery trial sifts God's people who are in the Laodicean state. Judgment begins with the house of God. That's what 1 Peter says. It begins with the house of God. Laodicea means nation of judgment. Mordecai sat in the gate, judgment. Daniel, a type of God's end time people, means judged of God. We are told to study the books of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And the typological story in the book of Daniel 
are typological stories of God's people. Esther 2.19, And when the virgins gathered together the second time. Isn't that fascinating? There was a first time when the virgins gathered together and there was a second time. There was a Protestant movement. It rejected. It refused to keep the commandments. And there's a second gathering of virgins. Then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. He sat in the king's gate. Then Daniel requested of the king and he said, we go to Daniel, and he said about his three friends over the affairs of the province, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Was he also a type of the judgment? Yes. Jeremiah, Baruch, read the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemar. Raya, the son of Shaphan, the scribe in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate. All judgment messages. When we come to Ezekiel, we have the image of the gate. And what was there? The image of jealousy, which provokes to anger and jealousy. We'll come to that in a moment. So the Apostle John in vision heard a loud voice in heaven exclaiming, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short and his work of deceit and destruction reaches its culmination in the time of trouble. And we know that the whole world will be involved in a ruin more terrible than came on Jerusalem of old. How close are we to these events? If we study the typology of the children of Israel, and if we study the state of the church, I must come to the conclusion that we are at the very brink. In the midst of the time of trouble such as not been since there was a nation, his, God's chosen ones, will stand unmoved, Satan with all the hosts of evil cannot destroy, destroy the weakest of God's saints. All right. How does judgment affect God's people? And this is what I want to speak about tonight. Will God's church survive? The standard of judgment is the law, and in the final analysis, the issue is one of worship. It's not a question of legalism. This is a question of worship. Who do I acknowledge as the authority in my life? Who do I acknowledge as my creator and my redeemer? And the only way in which I can show that acknowledgement today is by my obedience to his precepts. And if he said, here are my commandments, and I keep them as he said, I acknowledge his authority. If another king comes along and says, now here are my precepts, you have to obey these rather than those, well then I'm worshipping the wrong entity. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness, says the psalmist. Or thy garments smell of myrrh. This is a picture of Jesus. Upon thy right hand did stand the what? The queen. In the gold of her fear. God doesn't do anything apart from his church. She is precious to him. She is beautiful. She is knee-bucklingly beautiful. Even though she is pathetic. She's beautiful. He sees her with the eyes of his righteousness. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. These are beautiful images in the Bible. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be reference to Christ. He will gather the virgins and his queen will be by his side. The gathering of God's people is the great theme of the return from exile. 
And there are so many issues involved here that it's complicated. It's like wheels within wheels. But there are great prophetic delineations. And the major prophets and the minor prophets intermingle and give evidences that will make the picture clearer. The prophet Jeremiah proclaimed, Behold, the day is come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And his name is the Lord our righteousness. So God's people must expound the righteousness of God, his character, which includes his love, his law, his salvation, everything about him. It must be a Christ-centered religion, not a legalistic religion. If we project a legalistic image, people are put off. If you live a life without being, if you live the righteous life without being judgmental, it's attractive. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth which brought us up, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. But they will say that they've gathered the ones that come out of the north country. So there will be this second application. We spoke about it yesterday. This parallel between the Exodus movement and the final gathering of God's people. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them. And we have a choice. We can be caught in the gospel net, or we can be hunted in the executive judgment. What do we want? We have a choice to make. Jeremiah says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. This is the great gathering. Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Isaiah says, And it shall come to pass that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant, and he will set up an enzyme amongst them. They will have a banner, a mark, a flagstaff, a sign. And that will be the Sabbath. Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign throughout your generations that I am the Lord that sanctifies. So there's this tremendous second gathering. And we must understand it in the context of Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' message, and the loud cry right at the end, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. And then we will sing the song of Moses and the land. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. Ezekiel 20, 34. This is the great prophetic theme of Adventism. There is no other denomination on the planet that preaches it. There isn't. You can search. But in the final conflict, God does not bypass his church. Don't forget that. There are people that say, I follow Jesus. You are following a head, but it has no body. It cannot walk. Isn't that so? The spirit and the, what say come? The spirit and the bride say come. God works with his church and he works through the church. But he will purify it in the fire of affliction and spew from its ranks. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. I quote a lot from the spirit of prophecy. And I wish we would do it more and more, not less and less. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church, 
shall be reflected to the world, his fullness and his sufficiency. When Paul was called on the way to Damascus, God didn't say, now listen, this is what I want you to do. He sent him to the church. God doesn't act without his church. The Redeemer of the world does not sanction experience and exercise in religious matters independent of his organized and acknowledged church. You can go right throughout the Bible. Many have an idea that they are responsible to Christ alone for their light and experience, independent of his recognized followers on earth. But in the history of the conversion of Saul, great principles are laid down, and we've already discussed them. And now there are so many who ask, how can I associate myself with an apostate church? Not everybody in the church is apostate, but there are many apostasies in the church, yes. And rather than run away from them or go and exclude myself and yap like a little dog against the apostasies, face them. Are they here, yes or no? Yes, they're here. And I'm grateful that they're here or else we'd be the wrong church, as I discussed yesterday. But here comes a terrible thing. Persecution cleanses the church. You know, we are praying and praying and praying that things will change. I have bad news for you. Persecution is going to cleanse the church. Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Adversity purges them out of the church. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged. And those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers. They'll leave. We are told that they see the th matters in about the same light as Babylon sees it. I sit in many discussions and I'm pained and I want to weep because I see it. So in spite of its condition, the church is not Babylon, but there are Babylonians in its ranks. Right? Good. In the absence of persecution... There have drifted into our ranks men who appear sound in their Christianity, unquestionable, but who, if persecution should arise, would go out from us. This is a spirit of prophecy. I'm on solid ground here. If it weren't for the spirit of prophecy, I'd be dead meat long ago. The church will be sifted by fiery trials. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. We pray for unity, we pray for unity, but we will see both separation and unity. It's going to happen. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock and they will leave under one pretext or another. Testimonies, Volume 6. It's going to happen. The Lord has not given you a message to call the Seventh-day Adventists Babylon and to call the people of God to come out of her. All the reasons you may present cannot have weight with me on this subject. I know the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. I tell you, my brethren, the Lord has an organized body through whom he will work. When anyone is drawing apart from the organized body of God's commandment-keeping people, when he begins to weigh the church in his human scales, begins to pronounce judgment against him, then you may know he's, God is not leading me. He's on the wrong track. We need to fortify ourselves with this because this is happening more and more and more and more. Now, there are many independent ministries. But if they work for and with the church, great. Sometimes it's hard to work with the church. Work with it anyway, whether they want it or not. And we are told that the straight testimony will produce the shaking. I asked the meaning of the shaking, and it was because of the 
straight testimony. There are those amongst us who will make f confessions as did Achan, too late to save themselves. They are not in harmony with his right. There is a problem in the church, let's face it. Do we need an organized church? Can't we just do our own thing? Do we really have to be organized? Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in amongst this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the Word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly, and there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization in order that that has been built up by wise, careful labor. License must not be given to all disorderly elements that to d desire to control the work at this time. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work there is no such thing as every man is being independent. I'm not independent. As we near the final crisis, instead of feeling that there is less need of order and harmony of action, we should be more systematic than heretofore. We don't need less order, we need more order. Hard to understand, say some. I love this little article that was written by Keith Drury. He makes an interesting statement regarding beheading Christ. He says, I have decided to submit to Christ's tastes in bride picking. If he wants the church as his bride, I will accept her too. Jesus Christ, the head of the body, is easy to love. The body of Christ is harder to love. I think he had experience. But I have chosen to love her for one single reason. Christ loves her and considers her beautiful. Perhaps he sees possibilities in her I don't see. Perhaps that's how he sees me too. Isn't that cute? I like that. There's a very special authority of God's church. I'm instructed to say to Seventh-day Adventists the world over, God has called us as a people to be a peculiar treasure unto himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united in the spirit and counsel of the Lord of hosts to the end of time. Excuse me, are we perfectly united? No, but we're called to be perfectly united. While it is true that the Lord guides individuals, it is also true that he is leading out the people. Now, we need to distinguish these things in our mind, otherwise we get confused. Not a few separate individuals here and there, one believing this thing and another that. No, 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 we're working together. Some had advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently. No, 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 there's no such thing. I'm part of this church. On the other hand, leaders amongst God's people are to guard against the danger of condemning the methods of individual workers who are led by the Lord to do a special work that but few are fitted to do. Let brethren in responsibility be slow to criticize the movements that are not in perfect harmony with their methods of labor. Does this mean, in other words, that the spirit of prophecy tells me I'm not restricted by the structure? I have a certain leeway I'm an individual and I can work with God and God can work with me and any of you as he chooses. Is that right? Amen. And we should be very careful when we say, not this way or that way. But now you have these groups in the church, some of those who act in a way which is totally contrary to what the other group thinks. And how can two walk together if they are not in, human, in harmony with each other? Now this is where the spirit of prophecy is so helpful. We must study these things. Christ's call for unity. Manuscript 10. Our church members see that there are differences of opinion amongst the leading men. And they themselves enter into controversy regarding the subjects under dispute. Doesn't happen at Loma Linda, fortunately. 
Christ calls for unity. Now listen carefully. But he does not call for us to unify on wrong practices. This is important. The God of heaven draws a sharp contrast between pure, elevating, ennobling truth and false, misleading doctrines. There's a sharp distinction. Even though I'm in the church, even though I'm in the structure of the church, I'm still responsible to God. And I must test the spirits. He calls sin and impenitence by the right name. He does not gloss over wrongdoings with a coat of untempered mortar. I urge our brethren to unify upon a true scriptural basis. Whew! That takes a lot of my mind. Do you feel better too? Does this mean that there must be a church within a church? Now it gets complicated. God has a church. It is not the great cathedral, neither is it the national establishment, neither is it the various denominations. It is a people who love God and keep His commandments. And when two or three of such are gathered together, he is with them. Now, in the light of this tremendous conflict within the church, will the church stand? I'm going to ask some hard questions today, and I'm going to give some whew, things. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains triumphant while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. So the church is going to stand. But the conflict isn't getting less, isn't it? Getting more? Yes, it's getting more and more. Now I'm going to discuss with you three typological factions within the church. And these three typological factions give us the complete picture the other prophets color it in. There's the Daniel group, there's the Ezekiel group, and the Jeremiah group. Were they contemporaneous prophets, yes or no? They all were there at the same time during the tragic final collapse of Jerusalem, which serves as the great type of what happens. Isn't that so? Okay. So you have the Daniel faction, which represents that the faction that maintains a faithful relationship to God even in the face of adversity. True worship is here contrasted with false worship. You know, whenever I read the book of Daniel, I get discouraged. Have you noticed that he's the only book where an individual, Daniel, doesn't put a foot wrong? Have you noticed that? He's perfect. And his friends are Perfect. Nowhere else, not even Abraham, not even Moses qualifies. Only Daniel and his friends. They're perfect. Are they? God sees them as perfect. This is the group within the church that God sees as perfect. Then we have the Ezekiel group, and that represents those that practice syncretism. In other words, wish to mingle religious forms, the worship of the God of Israel and Babylonian worship. And they have a compromise in their faith. Now Jeremiah, he was the one who was actually in Jerusalem. And he sat under the Sanhedrin. <laughs> He sat under the structures, and he represents that political leadership faction that, like the Pharisees in the time of Jesus, would sacrifice truth for the same of sake of structure. And they have some very hard things to say. But we must remember that in spite of all of this, the Daniel group is throughout all of it. These are not in separate places. These, this is a mixture of the three. Our church is a mixture of the three. We are the antitype. That's what it was like right towards the end. That's what it will be like right towards the end when we are there. 
Consider the aspects of the worship and the integrity covered in the book of Daniel. Was Daniel a health reformer, yes or no? Yes, in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king required of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. We read in the spirit of prophecy, Daniel was surrounded by all the allurements of sin, but he chose not to partake. So he didn't separate himself. He didn't form a monastery. He didn't create a reform movement. He didn't do any of that stuff. He identified himself with God's people. And he stayed upright in spite of the circumstances. Okay? In chapter 2, we read about the humility and the inclusivity of Daniel. Daniel would say, the wise men and the astrologers and the magicians cannot do it. But I can. No, he didn't. He said, there's a God in heaven who can do it. He was a humble man. God wants us to have humility. As for the secret, it is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. So these are his character attributes. Are we part of the Daniel faction or are we part of the other faction? What are we going to be part of? He was always inclusive. We have sinned and committed iniquity. To us belongs confusion of face. Yea, all Israel transgressed thy law, therefore the curse is poured upon us. Moses didn't separate. Daniel didn't separate. We shouldn't separate because there are all these things happening in the church. Chapter 3, besides the eschatological aspect, the chapter contrasts true and false worship. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the, all kinds of music. And then the decree went out and the king said, when you hear the sound of the flute, the harp, the da 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 all kinds of music. And then it says again, and then the da 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 Why do you think he repeats it over and over and over? you think music could be a snare at the end of time? I think it could quite possibly be. Nebuchadnezzar and said, Is it true to the friends that you won't serve my gods? No, we won't, they said. We'll throw you into the furnace. Didn't help. Now if you be ready, and we have again all these things. Notice what they said. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. The new King James makes it easier to understand. We have no need to answer you in this matter. That's pretty clear. Our God, whom we serve, is able. He will deliver us, but even if he does not, let it be known, we won't worship. That's the Daniel faction in the church. And no matter what happens, you don't have to partake. Were they at the feast? Yes. They just refused to bow down. So if you have a Babylonian feast in one of your churches, take out your Bible and read. And be an example to someone. They say, excuse me, why are you not partaking? I'm partaking in worship. I'm reading my Bible. When you sing something decent, I'll sing with you. I do that. I do that when they sing all this funny stuff. I sit down and I read my Bible. And when they sing a hymn, I sing. Ah, I sing. It's, I'm a bit weird. In all the ages, God had witnesses. Joseph. He was maligned and he was persecuted and he was accused but he stood. David was hunted like a beast of prey. Daniel into the lion's den. James, Job deprived of his things. Jeremiah cast into the quagmire. Stephen, Paul, John, all of them. We can do the same. We need a spirit of true worship. Just because 
things are chaotic around us doesn't mean we need to capitulate. So the principles and practices must be purged of heathenism. The ritual service ceased in order that the heart might be revived. The outward glory was removed that the spiritual might be revealed. Our outward glory might be removed that the spiritual may be revealed. We're going for tough times. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 provide insight into God's dealing with the powers of earth, His patience, His justice. 7 to 12, the great prophecies. So Daniel... The Daniel faction will be well informed about the character of God. Is that correct? And how he deals with people. The Daniel faction will be well, well versed in prophecy. Right? So they'll be health reformers. They won't be proud. They will be humble. They will be students of prophecy. These are all the things that happen to the Daniel faction. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So the Daniel faction is what I would like to belong to. But then it means to do all that the Lord commanded. Isn't that right? Not in a superior, judgmental way, but because you love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind. Now we get to the scary bit. The Ezekiel faction. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. Hmm. They are impudent children, stiff-hearted. I send you to them, and you shall say them to them, whether they hear or whether they forbear. So there's a faction that is stiff-hearted and stiff-necked and stubborn, and even when you speak to them, they don't listen. Fortunately, I've never come across them. <laughs> when I say unto the wicked, you will surely die, and you've given him the warning, then fine. But if you don't warn him, the blood will be on whom? On you. So we have a duty to speak. Ezekiel chapter 5. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind. And I will draw out the sword after them. And thou shalt take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Whew, not much left there. Almost all of them gone. And then take of them again and cast them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For therefore thereof shall a fire come forth into the house of Israel. There's a terrible ordeal coming. The sifting is going to be a painful process. And we will go through Jacob's trouble, like doves in a valley, mourning. What are the reasons for the judgments? Let's have a look. Disobedience, Ezekiel 5 verse 7. Therefore thus says the Lord, because you multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are around about you. Disobedience, idolatry, your altars shall be desolate, your images shall be broken, I will cast down your slain men before your idols. They rejected the prophets. Ezekiel 7.26, mischief shall come upon mischief, rumor shall be upon rumor. They shall seek a vision of the prophets, but the law shall perish from the priests and counsel from the ancients. The law is no more, and their prophets find no vision from the Lord. So here we have a group within the church. This is the same time period as Daniel lived where these things are happening in the church. And the condition of the leadership, please, not everyone in leadership. Leadership is very big. But there's a tendency. And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month and the fifth day of the month as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me 
that the hand of the Lord fell there upon me, and behold, in lower likeness as the appearance of fire. And he sees this glory of God. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted my eyes towards the north. That's where the throne of God is, who should receive worship. And I saw the image of jealousy. Jealousy? Jealousy within the ranks? Fighting? Infighting? Jealousy amongst groups? Warnings have been given me that the publishing house and so on and so, but the image of jealousy was long set up. Stop being jealous. No, this one can't speak here. This is my throne. That one can't speak there. Keep this one out. Does it happen in our church? Don't let that one speak. He'll say this, that, and the other. The 70 elders are in sympathy with idolatry. And there stood before the 70 men of the ancients, the house of Israel, in the midst of them stood. And it tells you all the priests that were there. And he brought me to the gate of the Lord's house towards the north. And behold, there sat the women weeping for Tammuz. They were probably eating hot cross buns. <laughs> and they were in sympathy with the religion of Babylon, and they rebuked all who weren't like that. And how were they? About five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple. About five and twenty with their backs towards the temple of the Lord. Worship the sun towards the east. I don't know whether it's coincidental that the executive committee consists of about 25 men. But I'm not talking about specific people here. It's about a condition. It's about a condition. So do we have an anti-typical anti equivalent? Do we have leadership in sympathy with Rome, with Tammuz? Because that's what Rome is. Adventists are to be purged of the red whore of the Mediterranean syndrome. Malachi Martin, he talks about this syndrome. And uh, fascinating. Blavatsky has the following to say. This method of calculating by neurosis without allowing any consideration for the secrecy in which the ancient philosophers who were exclusively of the sacerdotal order held their knowledge. I hate the way these occultists write gave rise to the greatest errors. It led the Jews, as well as some of the Christian Platonists, to maintain that the world would be destroyed at the end of 6,000 years. Gale shows how firmly this belief was rooted in the Jews. Do we have that belief? Yes. It has also led modern scientists to discredit entirely the hypothesis of the ancients. It has given rise to the formation of different religious sects which, like the Adventists of our century, are always living in the expectation of approaching destruction of the world. We're a menace. And there are people who are in sympathy with Rome and say, put off the coming of the Lord. If you are putting it off, you are not in sympathy with God's word, nor are you in harmony. Called to expose the man of sin. We have been called to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Not make it less prominent. I don't see any use for our Bible commentaries which are so vague that you wouldn't know whether it was the ice cream man or whoever who is the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. It's the papacy. Write it there. That's what the reformers wrote. That's what it is. We have nothing to be ashamed of. All the evidence points that Rome hasn't changed. The people are to be shown what they may expect from the papal power. Four manuscript release. I'm not hard on Catholics. I love Catholics. I was one myself. I love it when a Catholic priest phones me and says, Thank you for your messages. I have come out. The church that holds to the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. I have discussions with leaders all the time. They phone me at two o'clock at night and tell me I forbid you to say that the Pope is the Antichrist. Yes. I'm talking about 
high leaders that phone me like that. And I say, excuse me, but the spirit of prophecy says so. Then they say, we don't hold to that 19th century childhood disease of Seventh-day Adventism. Then I say to them, excuse me, but I don't have to listen to you because you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Goodbye. <laughs> they then phone me back. And say, how dare you say that? I said, well, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I made certain promises at my baptism. And one of them was that I will uphold the spirit of prophecy, and you have just told me you don't do it, therefore I don't consider you as authoritative in this issue. Cheers for the second time. Rome never changes. I'm not quoting myself. Who am I quoting here? It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. But that doesn't make my church Babylon because scattered throughout it is the Daniel faction. Don't forget that. And the contrary is, Ezekiel is very hard. And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. This is an amazing verse. God takes something and he sums it up like I would never dare to do it. So I'll read it to you in the New King James. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot in that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. So the Bible doesn't call us Babylon, but it calls us a prostitute, calls us a whore. And then it says we're a stupid whore. <laughs> That's what it says. We're a stupid whore. I mean, a normal whore at least gets paid for her services. We're so stupid, we paid. <laughs> Does it say that? That's what it says. Do we belong to some of our groupings, to ecumenical councils? Yes. Are there dues to be paid for that? Yes. So we pay to be a whore. We're stupid. Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrong amongst the professed people of God and murmur in their hearts? If not openly against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. These, unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and holding up the hands of the sinners in Zion, will never receive the mark of God Sealing, approval. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by the mark by the man in linen, that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done. Don't run away from the church. Separate yourself. There's no consistency in that. Sigh and cry. Sigh and cry. Things can change. I was in an East Block country. And the pastor had a, a guitar around his neck, and that was his sermon. He loathed everything I stood for. And then after about a week of my preaching, he was very antagonistic. Suddenly, just like this, he changed. And he came to me, and he thanked me for my lectures. Not for anything I had said, nothing. What I had said couldn't have convinced him at all. But he went home, and I think it was his grandmother, who was very old, 87 or something like that. And she said to him, she was in those meetings, she said, now I can die in peace, because I know that the old Adventist message is still alive. Yeah. Isn't that nice? And that changed him. That's what I said what his grandmother said. So don't give up. I was in a, in a country 
a country that rules the world. And I went to a meeting, and the pastor came onto the stage with an earring in one ear, I think it was the left ear, and a guitar around his neck and an open shirt, and he made a bedlam of noise. Rock and roll music from the beginning to the end. And I finally got a short window of opportunity to speak. And a young man said in the audience, uh, excuse me, what do you think of the drums on the stage? And all these things happening here. I said to him, I'm delighted to see them. And I carried on with my lecture. There was a bit of silence. And then after about 15 minutes, I said to them, you want to know why I was delighted? Because the spirit of prophecy says just before the close of probation, drums will come into the Adventist church. We're going home. <laughs> so in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men in responsibility of not glorified God. And the terrible decree goes out, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women but come not near any man on whom is the mark. We have to be prayerful. Prayerful. The general slaughter of all those who do not thus see the wide contrast between sin and righteousness and do not feel as those who do not stand in the counsel of God and receive his mark is described in the order of the five men with the slaughter weapons. It's coming. Upon us as ministers, God has placed the burden of solemn responsibility. Realizing that we are his chosen watchmen, we should have constant concern and forethought in regard to the state of the church. Now it's nine o'clock. There's still a Jeremiah faction and then there's still a summary. That could take another 30, 35 minutes. What do you say? Keep going? Rejection of the spirit of prophecy is tantamount to throwing the ship's compass overboard and then drifting like the rest of the Protestant world towards Rome. Would you agree? Because if we reject that, we could end up the Willow Creek without a paddle or we could be purposefully driven towards a, on a saddle back to nowhere. Don't clap. This is a serious business. This is a serious business. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination. What would we do without the spirit of prophecy? By exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling, converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles, it's an emotional religion. So if the truth is sacrificed, we end up with a new spirituality and we embrace spiritual formation, contemplative prayer, neurolinguistic programming, and salvation by decibel. <laughs> Are these things happening in our church, yes or no? Is this syncretism mixing truth and error? Yes, we can't deny it. So new theologies flourish when truth is abandoned. And we have all these funny things. Ford theology, get rid of the sanctuary message, the investigative judgment, put that into the waste paper basket. And all that remnant theology, and uh, we even end up with pantheism. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts, says Ezekiel and put the stumbling blocks of their iniquity before their face, should I be inquired of at all by them? Please remember that even if you see these things, you may not be just mental because you do not know if the man in charge is Aaron or if he is Caiaphas. Will you remember that? I'm not saying climb onto a banner and onto a bandwagon and go crazy. How do I meet them? As the Kellogg crisis was met. Head on. Hit the ship. 
Towering high above the ship was a gigantic iceberg. Meet it. <clears throat> it's the only way to meet error. Expose it with truth. But let the truth do the cutting and don't you do the cutting. That night I was up at one o'clock writing as fast as my hand could pass over the paper. I've been hoping that there would be a thorough reformation and that the principles for which we fought in the early days and which were wrought out in the power of the Holy Spirit would be maintained. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. Then she moved forward on her way. This ship is going to have many such confrontations. The sinners in Zion will be sifted out. We must be divested of our self-righteousness, arrayed in the righteousness of Christ, and we must be sanctified through the obedience of the truth. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, says Ezekiel. So even in the Ezekiel faction, there will be a remnant that will come out. Don't give up on your brothers and sisters. Don't write them off. Love them. Love them. Let's go to the Jeremiah faction. I'm in big trouble here. Some of the leaders in Jerusalem were ruling subject to the approval of the king of Babylon. Is that right? Yes, they were vassal kings. We might have some vassal kings amongst us. I don't know. Is it my job to search them out? No. Jeremiah was ostracized by the leaders. He was beaten, placed in stocks, lowered into cisterns, and banned from speaking. Now, I have another sermon on Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a type of the three angels' messages. All the components of the three angels' messages are in Jeremiah. That's a lecture on its own. So if you preach the three angels' messages, you're going to be placed in stocks. You're going to be beaten. You will come out full of boils, walking, as though you had just been in a hailstorm. Has a nation changed their gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not promise. Prophet, be astonished. My people have committed two evils. They have not only forsaken the fountain of living water, but they've made their own cisterns. Thus says the Lord, stand in your ways. But they said, we will not hearken. Some of them are so stubborn they will not listen, says the Bible. Now, the decree in Jeremiah says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We mustn't be part of that faction. And then we have a spirit of popery in the church. I'm not going to read all this, but this is a fascinating dream. You can read it in First Testimonies 5.77. I dreamt I was at Battle Creek. And there she was in her house, and then she saw a procession coming towards the house. And the procession was going to prescribe, take away everything. And she looked again, and she saw, oops, it's a Catholic procession. And they were marching in Catholic procession, and then she looked again, and what did she see? that many of the leaders that she knew were in the procession. These are fascinating. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to re read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me. Mark the countenances. If I would only tell me what I've done. And she wept and wept and wept. She writes in testimonies to ministers, a strange thing has come into our churches. Men who are placed in position of responsibility that they may be wise helpers to their fellow workers have come to suppose that they were set as kings and rulers. We have such people. They tell you exactly what you must do and what you may not do. Be sure to labor in such and such a way. You will not do this and you will not do that. I had one tell me 
that uh, he'll remove the projector, which he did. And then he said, now try and give your lectures without equipment. So I went onto the stage and I said, you know, the choir sang so beautifully. This was outside people in an in a outside evangelism. And they removed my equipment because I'm giving the three angels messages. So I said, the organizer sitting over there lives just around the corner. It seems that he has not set up the projector, but the choir sang so beautifully. Do you mind if they sing some more while he goes and fetches them? <laughs> so these things happen with stuff. In his labors, each worker is to look to God. We are to labor as men and women who have a living connection with God. These are things that God will not allow. What is it? If we look only to men for guidance. He will put his burden upon his burden bearers. Every individual soul has a responsibility before God. And he's not to be arbitrarily instructed by men as to what he shall do, what he shall say, and where he shall go. We are not to put con confidence in the counsel of men and assent to do all that shall, they shall say unless we have evidence that they are under the influence of the Spirit of God. I don't have to listen to everyone in the church. God has given me a brain and God has given me a conscience. But that doesn't mean that I must neglect the counsel of godly men. Even if I have to change my course and change my mind. But I cannot have a spirit of popery. All should be careful about presenting new views of the scripture. Here's the counter side. I can't just go and be like a bull in a china shop. So by way of contrast, before they are given these points, thorough study and are fully prepared to sustain them from the Bible, introduce nothing that will cause dissension without clear evidence that it is God who is giving the special message. We should be circumspect and wise. This is a fascinating story. Jeremiah is locked up and he gets his scribe, Baruch, to go and read to the king what the prophecy says. And Baruch goes and reads it, and he reads it where? In the higher court at the entry of the new gate. And what do they do? They take his scroll and they cut it up and they throw it in the fire. Isn't that right? So the scribe goes back to Jeremiah and says they cut up the scroll. And Jeremiah says, don't worry, I've got it on my hard drive. I'll cut another DVD for you. <laughs> Go and play it again in the king's court. And by the way, I have some new information, and he adds it and said, there, give them a double dose. It happens. And so they consumed it in the fire, and they threw it away. Not everybody will listen. And thou shalt say to Jeachim, king of Judah, thus says the Lord who has burnt the scroll, why hast thou written therein, saying the king of Babylon shall destroy this land? They won't listen. They won't listen to the three angels' messages. Some people in our church just won't listen to it. That doesn't mean I mustn't preach it. Preach it. The city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, which shall take it. These people over here, were all people that were ostracized for standing for the spirit of prophecy. Unbelievable. We will have a revival. If the workers will humble their hearts before God, the blessing will come. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. That's what happened in the Jeremiah faction. Generations of iniquity, keeping mercy for thousands. Now listen to this. I'm going to be on dangerous ground now. Shake your heads and wake up because... I want you to think about this for a little bit. This is not time setting. This is setting the environment of time. Generations of iniquity. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression of sin, that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. Now let's look at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
Joel. Tell your children of it. So you tell your children, second generation. And let your children tell their children, third generation. And their children, another generation, four generations. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten. The palmer worm eats the one generation. The locust eats the next one. The canker worm eats the next one. The caterpillar eats the next one. So truth gets less and less and less and less and less. The remnant gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Time setting. But the day and the hour of his coming Christ has not revealed. He stated plainly to his disciples that he himself could not make known the day of and the hour. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Our church is in precisely the condition that the church was before the final events. Is it so or is it not? It's the greatest sign that we're nearly at home. Four generations. Four times 40 is how much? 160. What does that bring us to? Over time, 2004. 2004. In the next generation, the gathering takes place. So are we in the final generation of gathering, just according to the typology, yes or no? Each generation was divided into four watches of ten years. You don't know in which watch he is coming. Is he coming in the first watch? Is he coming in the second watch? Is he coming in the third watch? You don't know. But the Bible does suggest that he comes at midnight. That would be at the end of the first watch. That's not very far. But you don't know whether his long suffering will postpone it until the second watch or the third watch. You don't know in what watch he's coming. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord. According to this typology, we are in the final watches of this planet. And we could be this close. If he comes at the end of the first watch, wow. That's just around the corner. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And he shall come in the sec and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. I'm hoping he comes at the end of the first watch. I saw watch after watch, Ellen White uses. Now I'm going to do a final typology. And I'm on dangerous ground, and I'm not saying that this is so. I'm merely suggesting it's a possibility. The shipwreck of Paul. Because people say to me, will this church stand? Will it go through as a structure? Or will it dissipate and we will all do our individual thing at the end? These are important questions. And we need to ask God, is there any, any light in this? And for what it's worth, I give it to you. But it's not a law of Medes and Persians. And don't say, he said, this is how it's going to be. Acts 27, 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon, this ship that Paul was sailing in. And we being exceedingly tossed with tempest, time of trouble, the next day they lightened the ship. People go out, ship gets lighter. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. We're going to lose some things. Some things that a part of a ship are going to... Have we lost hospitals, churches, da-da-da, da-da-da? Yes, we've lost some. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. It's going to become tough. 
But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss, and now I exhort thee, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life amongst you, but of the ship. Okay. How be it? We must be cast upon a certain island. And when the fourteenth night was come, we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight. Are there sounds which you are hearing? Okay. The shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. By the way, which island did they land on? The island of Malta, the military headquarters of the Knights of Malta, the military power and might of the Church of Rome. Did Babylon destroy ancient Jerusalem? Would the king of antitypical Babylon also come with his power and his might against the church? Let's read on. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, don't do it. And when they had let down the boats into the sea under the color that they would have cast anchors out beforehand, in other words, they were pretending, ooh, I'm going. Paul said unto the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Don't go. No matter how big the storm, don't go. Stay. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Wherefore I pray you take some meat, take some food. For this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. Internalize God's word. Make it your bastion. Read the spirit of prophecy. Don't lose hope. Hang on. Stay on the ship or you cannot be saved. And they were of good cheer. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. It's fascinating. This bread, this gospel, cast it out amongst the nations start screaming about the gospel and salvation. And when they'd taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoist the mainsail to the wind and made towards the shore. Here we come. We're heading towards a crash with the forces of Malta. But here we come. And falling into place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. There will be a vicious attack from behind. Don't worry, the captain of the guard is there. Those Egyptians won't get through the fiery pillar. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, a death decree. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. There will be a turning around of the decree. And the rest, and then what happened? And the ship broke up, and the rest, some on boards, and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass, they escaped all safe on land. The ship is going to go through. It's going to get smashed right at the end here, right at the end. There's a beautiful parallel when we come to the latter rain, but we'll do that later in another lecture. And now look what happens. And when they escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita Malta. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain. Are you getting the picture? Here, when the final crash comes, there is the outpouring of the latter rain. And what happens? 
The serpent and the viper tries to bite, it doesn't happen. The divine rebuke has been removed. The serpent cannot harm you. The miracles start happening. The healings happen. He shook off the beast in the fire. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10, verse 19. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, and then it tells about how these people are converted and how people are healed. This is the outpouring of the latter rain. We read in the spirit of prophecy and vision of the night representations passed before me a great reformatory movement amongst God's people. Many were praising God. The sick were healed. Other miracles were wrought. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. And the world seemed lightened with this glory. This ship is going through to the end. If you jump ship, you're in trouble. And it shall be said in that day, Lord, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This church will make it right through to the end. There is a law coming, it will strike the military power. The ship will break up, but right at the very end, when the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon God's people and the world is lightened with its glory, don't leave the ship. Don't leave the ship. Amen.